Thank you. Okay, let's go. The two crack caterpillars crawled up and died on his head. <laughs> it's like a meteor shower hit your face as I was going to it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Oh Our top story. They decided to use they decided to use Brendan Keith's face for the 1990. That colleges are, quote, unfairly restraining trade and setting similar levels of tuition and financial aid, end quote. But what are the facts of the case? And what is Kenyon's position on the investigation? And how does the college feel about accusations of price fixing? I filed this story earlier. Invoking the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Justice Department announced an investigation immediately after an article about price fixing appeared in the Washington Post last August 9th. Since then, articles chronicling the investigation have appeared in the New York Times, Newsweek, and in Time magazine. The Wall Street Journal said, quote, the Ivy League schools are part of a price-fixing system that OPEC might envy, end quote. With all of the media attention to rising tuition costs, as well as to the price-fixing investigation itself, the Justice Department was under increasing pressure to widen the investigation. Early last semester, the Justice Department expanded the price-fixing investigation to include 50 colleges. Kenyon was one of those colleges named in the expansion. Originally, close to 100,000 documents were subpoenaed from Kenyon. Among them were all memos, letters, notes, and papers having anything to do with the setting of tuition, financial aid, or salaries. In addition, the Justice Department requested transcripts of every senior staff meeting back to 1985 as well as a transcript of any executive conversation, casual or formal, about tuition or financial aid. This initial request was reduced to some 14,000 individual documents and transcripts. Nevertheless, Vice President for Finance, Joe Nelson, said filling that request was no easy task. It was a major effort. There were you know, several staff members involved in hard work and uh, long hours uh, because the response, we, we got an extension on the response time. The initial, I don't, these are not exact dates, but rough, I think that thing came in on or about October 10, and I think they wanted a response from us by December 1st or something, but it was, you know, it was impossible, to, and they, they extended that, uh, and we're glad they did. Considering the scale of the investigation, many have questioned whether Kenyon is actually involved in price-fixing practices. But in terms of, of, of calling each other up or writing to each other, communicating in any kind of a way um, prior to decisions or during the decision process or even uh, prior to the opening of school um, on admission um, or on financial aid, um, no, that's not, that's not something we do. Although Kenyon was officially subpoenaed by the Department of Justice, VP for Finance Joe Nelson maintains Kenyon's innocence. The only thing that I, I would add is that, that I, I personally, and I, and I think I can uh, 
speak for the college, are, are, are fairly confident about, about this issue. And, I, and I, I feel strongly that when all the facts are known and reviewed by the Justice Department, uh, that Kenyon will not be associated with any wrongdoing whatsoever. Kenyon has not been contacted by the Justice Department since the last of the subpoenaed documents were sent in December. What do you see uh, the future of this investigation from the Kenyon viewpoint, uh, and can you offer a timeline of uh, how you see the investigation shaping up here on campus? We're, we're told that the next, uh, the next phase of the investigation will be that the Justice Department will want to speak with some persons on campus yet, yet to be identified, uh, and that that may be a formal deposition uh, or that might be an interview, maybe such as this, uh, something that's reasonably formal but not quite the legal proceeding uh, that a deposition would be. Uh, when that'll be, we really don't know. Uh, we think perhaps spring, but, but again, not hearing anything from the Justice Department is difficult. Whether or not Kenyon or any of the other 50 colleges is guilty of price fixing is not known. It is clear, however, that the Justice Department has already altered the climate in which tuitions are set. While the Justice Department sifts through the more than 14,000 documents submitted by Kenyon, the college confidently awaits the government's conclusions. For KCTV News, I'm Brennan Keefe. KCTV will keep you informed as the price-fixing story develops. And when we come back, a new examination period or not? Party Time Video, your new release connection on Coshocton Road in Mount Vernon. Party Time Video has all the new releases like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Turner and Cooch. They also feature multiple copies of all the new release videos. Coming in this month at Party Time Video, Lethal Weapon 2, Parenthood, Relentless, Wired, and The Package. And remember, Party Time has over 3,000 other videos and Nintendo games. That's Party Time Video, your new release connection next to Big Bear in Mount Vernon. Comps. The word strikes fear in the hearts of many Kenyan seniors. Short for a comprehensive exercise, this is the task that all students must complete in order to graduate. Many institutions have done away with the comprehensive exercise, but it remains here at Kenyon. What is evident, however, is the contrast of the levels of intensity of different department requirements. Students even going so far as to choose their major based on the difficulty of the senior exercise in that department. Karen Devine looks at the history of comps and why we still have them here at Kenyon. Kenyon College is a place proud of its history, its traditions. However, one tradition, that of comps, has served as a continual source of anxiety to generations of Kenyan students. In 1933, Kenyon adopted the system of comprehensive final examinations as a means of upgrading an already strong academic program. Thomas Greenslade Sr., Kenyon archivist, recalls that that decision created quite an uproar among students. This comps controversy has continued for over 50 years and is as pertinent to this year's seniors as it was to the class of 1937. Originally, comps were taken in May, one week before graduation. Seniors had one reading week to prepare for two days of written cumulative test. No credit was awarded for the test. However, if a student did not pass, he or she would not graduate. This stringent graduation requirement remained unchanged until the spring of 1973. Growing disdain for the program finally resulted in a student instigated petition that called for an examination of the traditional system. The college responded with the Commission for Comprehensives. Comprised of students, faculty, and administrators, this group's final report agreed that there were major problems with the traditional comprehensive finals and offered three proposals for improvement. Number one suggested that comps be replaced by a senior paper, project, or seminar for which the student would receive credit equal to that of one class. Number two called for a modification of the existing system only so far as necessary to correct weaknesses in it. Number three suggested the elimination of senior comprehensives altogether. To the chagrin of many seniors since, option three was not chosen. 
Instead, the faculty voted for proposal number two, changing the name to Senior Exercise. Under this plan, the nature of the comps was to be determined by the department, and the student was given a second chance to pass. It was hoped that these changes would promote a coherence in the major program, a statement that exists to this day in our student handbook. I spoke to academic dean Ann Ponder about the fact that Kenyon is one of very few schools that still require the completion of a senior exercise. In light of the fact that many schools have done away with senior exercises, how does Kenyon justify their continuation? It helps individual departments to analyze how their own majors are proceeding, what they know, how they know it, and how they're able to respond on exams or papers. It also, though, gives uh, Kenyon a distinctive opportunity uh, to permit students to perform under pressure. Uh, students, as they approach their senior exercises, uh, get uh, a time to uh, uh, reflect on their work in uh, the worst possible environment, uh, which helps them build the appropriate kinds of confidence that they'll need uh, in life after Kenyon. If a change were to occur within the senior exercise program, who or what could instigate this change? If there were widespread concerns uh, about the system as a whole, about its wisdom or about its fairness or about its equity, I, then any group of uh, students or faculty in the curriculum uh, in the community could bring that uh, to the academic policy committee. That's the faculty committee charged with responsibility to uh, superintend the curriculum and any proposal or questions or uh, set of inquiries uh, should be addressed to the APC. Have you encountered programs similar to Kenyon's senior exercises during your past administrative experiences? I am uh, seeing the reinstatement of something, whether it's a credit senior seminar or a senior paper to inform the coherence of their own academic uh, programs. Although comps do seem to have improved since the class of 37, Many opponents still question the academic value of such an exercise and feel that it creates undue anxiety. Many seniors complain that it is difficult to fully enjoy one's last months at college while taking four classes, completing comps, and trying to make career plans. As a 1967 Kenyan student once put it, some people just don't realize what a student has to go through to earn a degree at Kenyon. So it looks like the infamous senior exercise is here to stay. It's interesting to note, however, that if a change were to occur, it would most likely begin from within the student body. Until that day, the senior exercise will remain a very distinctive feature of the Kenyan experience. This is Karen Devine for KCTV News. Kenyon requires students to choose a major course of study, but fails to offer students the opportunity of selecting a minor. KCTV has learned of a proposal which would allow students the opportunity to minor in another subject of interest. KCTV correspondent Sam Sandberg will have the story next week. This week, Sam Sandberg joins us in the studio to discuss another controversial academic issue, the scheduling of the exam and grace periods. Now, Sam, why does Student Council want to change the current examination schedule? I think Student Council is worried about the amount of stress placed on students during that time. And the Academic Policy Committee is currently reviewing the plan that Student Council has proposed. But is a new exam schedule the way to go in solving this problem? I think that when they criticize the old system, they're not really thinking about all that the calendar committee has to consider in making Kenyon's academic calendar. For one thing, there needs to be 14 weeks of classes in each semester, with an equal number of credit hours given to Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes and Tuesday, Thursday classes. And outside of this, they need to provide time for Thanksgiving, October, and spring break. Um, a lot depends on when in the week dates fall. Students need to be able to leave campus by the 23rd of December, and that sometimes means that reading days do need to fall on weekends. In the student council plan, there would be no reading days on weekends, and there would be one and possibly two reading days with, between each and every exam day. Um, to allow for this, Thanksgiving break might have to be cut back. Uh, the school year might have to go to 13 weeks a semester, which would mean you'd still have to do the same amount of, week of work, just in less time. Or you'd have to start earlier in August and cut into um, summer vacation and jobs. And I think this would cause an awful lot more complaining from the students. 
Now, true, the grace period needs work, and it's true there is a lot of stress placed on students during this time, and the schedule doesn't always work out perfectly for everyone, but what schedule ever does? I think if we examine the guidelines that the calendar committee is working within, then we can see that our schedule, while not perfect, is not unacceptable either. Thank you. Back to you. Hiram Bullock, a famous guitarist who has performed with Sting, Billy Joel, and Paul Simon, among others, rocked Ross Hall last Saturday, awing the crowd with his electrifying solos. He thrilled over 400 students who danced with him in the aisles and cheered him on in his ascent to the balcony. Hiram spoke briefly with students before and after the concert and was quoted as saying, I love Kenyon and I'll come back whenever you want me to. That is, Brendan, if we uh, pay his fee again. The Hypochondriac opened last Friday at the Bolton Theater and finishes up this weekend with final performances on Friday and Saturday nights at 8 p.m. Thomas Turgeon's translation of Moliere's masterpiece, along with the talented cast, is undeniably entertaining, and tickets uh, for February 9th and February 10th shows are available at the Bolton box office, free with a Kenyan ID. For more information, call 427-5546. And now, with more insights into the housing problem, we bring you another edition of On the Hill with John Grant and Bill O'Hearn. Welcome to this week's edition of On the Hill. I'm John Grant. And I'm Bill O'Hearn. This, this week's issue was housing, fairness, or folly. But unfortunately, Bill and I can't find enough points to disagree on. So we would like to both urge you to read his article in the Kenyan Observer. And other than that, we'll defer that to a later date. Bill, what do you want to talk about? Well, John, I think we should talk about something that it came out of our discussion of the housing situation, but really this concept of community that we appear to have at Kenyon, that we try to sell so much. Yeah. Quite frankly, John, I think it's a lot of, it's not very sincere these days, what this concept of community, and I'm having real problems with it. And I'd like to attack the administration and the faculty for debasing that concept of community here. Go Kenyon. right ahead, Bill. Well, John, it's been my opinion, especially in this commission process, where the faculty have been telling basically the students how to live, the faculty on the Commission on Student Life continually have been telling the students that there is a right way to live and a wrong way to live, there's a way to associate and there's a way not to associate. And, you know, they were on that commission, they were there, and basically they're, they're being hypocritical. They're like, uh, it, it's amazing. All of them products of the 60s, <laughs> who were rebelling. Oh, oh, we're, we're getting back rebelling. to the McCarthyism argument of last week. <laughs> we have a bunch of liberal professors no, here no, at Kenyon, no, Bill. No, I'm not saying that. That, you know, they, they didn't want to be told how to live, and now they want to tell us how to live, okay? And it, things like the tables in Pierce Hall that have been moved, okay? Student council this afternoon, I'm on student council, we talked about the tables in Pierce. Twice now, unanimously, student council has voted to move those tables back to where they were. But Dean Steele and the administration have continually refused to you do You know what so. I would say? I would say, what is it, something like 78% of, of our money runs this college? Mm hmm Those people ought to just remember who's paying their bills. I, I, John, come on, we got to disagree here. I agree, the students are the people that really have been demanding certain things, a certain way of doing things, and the administration is not meeting uh, what the students really want, and the faculty is really playing really a, too much of a role in students' lives day to day. Well, are they really a part of the community? I mean, some, most of them are living without, uh, uh, I don't know whether most, but they're allowed to live outside of the 10-mile limit now. I mean, there are a bunch of questions you're raising that are, that are good, and the, the question is, do they really want to be a part of the community, or are they just making money here? I, th I, you know, I don't know. I mean, academics at Kenyon have been wonderful for me, and I know for many. But it seems to me, and I don't know about you, but in the last four years, the faculty aren't as, as much a part of life here as they used to be. There now, seem to be fewer invitations to dinners. There seem to be, uh, you, don't see your, you don't see your professors at the village inn or at the Can't live at without the your Dom Perignon, can you, Bill? <laughs> what I'd like to say, I mean, I'm not going to attack most of the members of the faculty. I have many good friends among the faculty. As do I. And I think that they do an excellent job. I think we need to look at our administration. I think we need to look at the process. Because I think that the students are the people who build this institution. They come here, they give their money to it, and they nurture it after they leave. And we need to be taken, you know, seriously. And, you know, ultimately, serving on committees, like I served on a committee when I was a sophomore, 
was a committee to, to, to appoint an, an Afri African Studies professor here at Kenyon. Well, I was a non-voting member of the committee. Now, now, stuff like that. I mean, I, I pay money to go to school here. And I, I think, think you I did as much work on that I committee did just as anybody. I as much work as everyone. And, and that, rep that uh, what, what was that about um, the Commission on Student Life, that people hadn't actually checked out what they were reading? Well, you look at it, um, you know, the students who generally are against a lot of the proposals that have come down, come down from the commission haven't really gone to check out the materials, uh, which, is, which is disappointing, but neither have faculty or anybody in the administration this fall. I mean, I'm frustrated. If this is a real community, I think it's time that the students be listened to regarding what they really want. When student council votes unanimously two weeks in a row to have the tables move back where they were, and it, one administrator refuses, we have a problem at Kenyon. And this idea of community is a crock. Bill, I would like to move the, the subject just a little bit to talk about fraternities and community at Kenyon. It seems to me, you know, I mean, I, I kind of get bothered by this because I don't want to say that, that someone's altruistic efforts weren't exactly meant in the best way. But, but there's just sometimes I feel, you know, fraternities sponsor all of these things, you know, these Women's Week. Well, what, what do fraternities have to do with Women's Week? I mean, basically, their relationship to women, other than being friends, has a lot to do with the weekends. But I'm not so, quite so sure why they want to, you know, support Women's Week, Lesbian Gay Straight Alliance Week, all of these things. Why are they doing that? Well, I think the administration thinks, is perceiving problems within the student community, which is that we're divided on these issues. Um, and the truth of the matter is, if you look at attendance at things like Women's Week and so on, the attendance just hasn't been very good. So the administration, well, the administration, by you know recognizing that, or so by basically, in the, fact, creating the hot seat for the fraternities, the has been pushing the fraternities well, wait a to, to basically, get involved. Basically, you're saying the administration is pushing the fraternities to get involved, and that's why they're getting involved. It's not on their own effort. They don't really want to do it. In some things, I, I suppose they're not as sincere as you might like them to be. And that disturbs me. Well, it should disturb people more than that. The fact is that on a lot of these issues, whether it be Women's Week or whether it be the Laura X Forum that we had in the fall, people just don't come because people feel like they're being intimidated or guilted into doing it. And that's the wrong kind of cooperation to so have. So in other words, the administration is guilting these people into, into make, making them go to these Laura X things. I think they're trying to, and it's not working, because then the people don't come at all. They now, get I would, alienated. I would disagree with you there. I think that there are a lot of people who go to those things that are serious about the issue and take them seriously. I, for one, the go, problem is I'm there serious. Are, the problem is there aren't a lot of people who go to them. Were you at the LARX forum? Yes. I don't remember seeing you there. You must, oh. have, been, you must, oh. have, been, you must have been one of the ten males who was there, because I was one male who was there. And I'm disappointed people don't go, but the administration... But the point is, okay, the fraternities sponsor these things. Do they encourage their members to go? Yes. Okay, good point. Yes. That's a good point, Bill, but I'm not quite sure that I agree with it. Well, I don't know. I would say that fraternities do encourage their people to go to, this, to the events, but it's hard because people don't feel, you know, that there's real sincerity going on, and I think that's a problem. At Kenyon, we really do have the structures, John. We have, I think, even the people, but we have to get to the point where we're working together again perhaps like we used to be. And that I think that has to come with the students really being listened to. Okay, and that's going to com come from this commission process that the students are really listened to. And I, I hope that we're able to utilize the structures that we have there uh, between the administrative, administration, faculty, and students. And I think, uh, I know you're attacking them a bit, I think the fraternities will play a key role in uh, reestablishing that sense of community at Kennedy. I hope they do. And let me just say that you know, I want, I'm, I'm just as much for, uh, um, for as you are allowing people to take part in the process, and I, I do agree with you about, you know, some problems with the administration. But I just want to say that, you know, fraternity should not sponsor something if they don't agree with it. And that's, you know, my concluding argument. I'm John Grant. And I'm Bill O'Hearn. And that's been this edition of On the Hill. Next week, national issues. simply because you did not have a student ID. It seems that even a passport won't work. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I hadn't read through the story. Can't see the color green, <laughs> Okay, I'm there. Okay, <clears throat> four. You could theoretically quit. Imagine when you're a senior and you command this place. Okay, four, four. 
How many times have you been to the library to check out materials and were not permitted to simply because you did not have a Kenyan student ID? It seems that even a passport, a driver's license, and possibly a note from your mother is just not enough to prove your identity as a Kenyan student. With the housing lottery approaching soon after spring break, many students are wondering if traditional housing will be kept on the South End for fraternities. And will the DeFi's be allowed back into Hanna next year? KCTV reporter Carla Bernberg examines the housing situation. Once everyone gets back from Christmas break, having completed one half of the year already, the next question that seems to follow is, where will I live next year? This question has arisen a little earlier this year, since the discussion of the Commission's report on student life has appeared to place some of the fraternity housing in jeopardy. I'm standing out here in front of the KC, which is used during the school year for everything from aerobics to parties to art exhibits, everything. But in a few months, end of March, beginning of April, students will be packed inside the KC waiting to see if they can get the housing of their choice. Whether they're waiting for a double, a far hall single, or one of the faculty houses, they all have to wait in line until their number is called to see whether they will be able to live where they want to next year. Although Kenyon's lottery system can appear confusing when you first read about it, Dean Robert Keister, the Assistant Dean for Student Residencies, clarified it greatly when I talked to him. The housing lottery has a series of steps that begins in the end of March. Mm -hmm. Begins with the, the outer houses that the college has. The, um, then it goes into the Far Hall Singles Lottery. Uh, the next step is the six-person apartment or suite lottery. Then the four-person apartment and suite lottery. And then finally the open doubles lottery. Although I was told that there were definitely no major changes in store for this next school year, it seems as if many plans are in the works for the future. All kinds of things have been proposed with what the Commission is talking about to um, some things under discussion with um, renovating um, the Bexleys and the new apartments or utilizing the space at the Bexley in a different way. So, but those are all fairly long term. Everyone seems to have their own ideas also about what should be done regarding the housing crunch. Build another dorm is a popular suggestion around campus, and I found some new student suggestions in the February edition of the Kenyon Observer. Among their many ideas, staff writers Bill O'Hearn and Dave Seed suggested that the college change both Manning and Bushnell dorms from doubles to entirely singles. That's a new one. The only definite change for this next year is that the DeFi's, who lost their housing last academic year as a punitive measure, are going to be back in Hannah again. The, the way it stands right now is that the DeFi's had lost their housing for one year. Um, pending anything happening, they then will be able to go back into that housing. So grab a roommate and choose where you want to live because the housing lottery is only a few short months away. This has been Carla Bernberg reporting for KCTV News. If you tuned in to the premiere of KCTV News, you saw our story on Dean Edwards' retirement. For many of you, this may have been the first time you've ever seen Dean Edwards. This week, KCTV went out in the field to find out just how well students know the administrators that govern them. Do you know who Frank Hale is and what he does here at Kenyon? Um, I know his name, but I'm not... Uh, he, wait, he is, um, he's director of... Uh, my, uh, like my night, I mean, uh, Do you know who Joe Nelson is? Who? Joe Nelson? No, I don't. Do you know who really runs the college besides President Jordan? Uh, Browning, maybe? Hi. Do you know what Dean Switzer's job is? Is he the Dean of Housing? Do you know what the difference is between the uh, Dean for Academic Advising and the Academic Dean is? Uh,. One's more of a dean for academic advising, and the other is more of an academic dean. Do you know who the director of development here is at Kenyon? Oh, sorry. Do you know what the development office does here at Kenyon? Um, and it helps support careers. Do you know who uh, Joe Nelson is? No. Oh, wait. No. I know. Do you know who uh, Doug Gibbons is? No, um, I don't go to Kenyon. Do you know what Cheryl Steele's position is, her title? I think she's the dean of st no, she's not dean of students, no. Isn't she, she's, wait, <laughs> I know this. <laughs> she's a dean for students. Do you know who the assistant dean of students is? No. Do you know who Cheryl Steele is? I know she's a dean. 
Do you know who the Dean for Housing is? Dean Fitzgibbon. Do you know what Mr. Keister does? I have no idea. Do you know who the Vice President for Development is? What his name is and what does he do here at Kenyon? Would that be uh, Joan Nelson? Or is that the Vice President for Development? Um, who is the Vice President for Development? Is that Givens? No. Stamp? No. <laughs> Is Stuart Fitzgibbon a dean in the housing department? Yeah. You know the answer to that. I'm an RA. I, I, I'm not a good person to ask. But he is a dean? Yeah, he is oh, the I dean know. of student residences. Oh, okay. Then what about Mr. Keister? What's his position? He is the assistant to the dean of student residences. Do you know what Tom Edwards' position here is at Kenyon? Who? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tom Edwards. No, what does he do? I'm sorry, I don't know who he is. <laughs> it seems from this edition of the KCTV opinion poll that many of the students, from freshmen on up to seniors, do not know the administrators here at Kenyon. In fact, those students that work the most with the administration, such as RAs and students in the SAC, do not know the administrators that we work with. Although we do not know the reason for this, we feel that right now we can show you who those administrators really are. At PBX 5837 or through computer mail on the Academic Vax Network. You can also write to KCTV at P.O. Box 1638, Gambier, Ohio 43022. Well, that's all the news we have for you this week. You can catch KCTV News next Wednesday in the shops all through lunch in Pierce TV Lounge at 5 and at 6 p.m. If you would like your event covered by KCTV or would like to suggest story ideas, you can reach Kenyon College Television at PBX 5837 or in the Academic Vax computer network. You can also write to KCTV at P.O. Box 1638, Gambier, Ohio, 43022. By the way, Brendan, I made a mistake last week. Jesse Jackson will be coming to campus on April 26th, but he'll be in Ernst instead of, instead of Ross Hall, as I mentioned, and I understand they're building a four-foot stage for him. That's all the news we have for you this week. You can catch KCTV next Wednesday in the shops all through lunch in Pierce Hall Lounge at 5.15 and 6 o'clock and in the Olin Auditorium at 7 and 7.30 p.m. Also, this edition of KCTV News will be on reserve in the AV listening and viewing room in the Olden Library. And that's the news from around the hill. Have a good week. KCTV News next week in the shops all through lunch, also in the Pierce Lounge at 5 and at 6 p.m. And there's two showings in the auditorium in the Olden Library at 7 p.m. and at 7.30 p.m. Uh, also, this edition of KCTV News will be on reserve in the Olin Library AV viewing and listening room starting Thursday. That's the news from around the hill. For all of us at KCTV, have a good week. I wanted to do a kettle brew. That's why. Oh, oh we, oh, we're not going to pull the lights. Yeah, why didn't we do that? Yeah, we should have done that. We could do it one more time. Yeah. All right. Uh, Colin can pull the lights, or Jenny can pull the lights. Besides, I as soon as you hear, have a good week. Yeah. And then we have to banter for about, we have to let it go a lot longer this time. I know. Last time we didn't do enough. All right, is it still recording? Yeah. Let it run. You ready? Yep. P.O. Box. Four. You can also write to KCTV at P.O. Box 1638, Gambier, Ohio, 43022. Well, that's all the news we have for you this week. You can catch KCTV News next week in the shops all through lunch, also in the Pierce Lounge at dinner at 5 and at 6 p.m., and in the auditorium in the Olin Library, two showings, 7 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Also, this edition of KCTV News will be on reserve in the Olin Library AV viewing and listening room starting tomorrow. That's the news from around the hill. For all of us here at the station, have a good week. I think it went well. How do you think it went? Not really, it, seriously. It was an interesting yeah. experience. We have to sit here for quite a while and, 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 and go through this. You could like write a letter to somebody. I think so. I think we can have a, a good show next week and I think things are going to go well. Um,
you know, I, I think things really will go on. What we have to do is start shooting on Sundays. I mean, uh, signing on Sundays and then shooting on um, on Mondays and then shoot Monday through Friday. And that well, way we from, can get that done. I want you to tell yeah. about the staff meeting tonight. I'll be interested in hearing the results. Exactly what happens, yeah. Yeah, that would be very interesting. We really have to sit here and talk just a little bit longer. I know it. Credits are rolling up over our face and et cetera, and people are. Yeah, and my name. And, and uh, I've, 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 Alden's name just went by at the very end of the credits, <laughs> and um, et cetera. And I think it's even well. I wish you'd talk so it didn't look like I'm talking to you at the end of every newscast and you're just listening, which would be nice anyway. So how many letters are there on the alphabet? Yeah. Yeah, well, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H I, J, K, K L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Sure, sure, Yeah, sure. I love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, and then add digits. Okay, we got <laughs> it. Fuck right. you. Yeah. Thank you. Lowercase hey. now, Ed. <laughs> Thank you. Why? Okay, <laughs> fuck you. Do. <laughs> Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, hey. iota, lapta, chemo, oh, you use I over prime, pi, kind of things. pi, chi, psi, omega. Yes, thank you. Thank you for playing. Yes. Thank you, okay. thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm pro-choice and I choose not to speak to you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, okay. sorry, I love freedom of speech. Yeah, that's uh -huh, good. Yeah, sure. that's good. That's, yeah. <laughs> hey, Coke, the quicker pepper upper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a little plug. <laughs> okay, that's all the news we have for you this week.